Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Today we are looking at episode three of The Rings of Power. We've had the first two episodes which dropped last week at the same time. Episode three is coming up in oh, a few hours time. Uh, and I am delighted that my special guest today is the one and only Clueless Fangirl. Helen, do you want to say hi? Hello everybody. And, and introduce yourself to all those who do not know who you are. What? Uh, yeah, no, sorry. My internet is a bit dodgy, so um, excuse me if if uh, um, my sound is a bit weird or off. It should go uh, back to normal. Yes, my name is Helen, uh, a.k.a. The Clueless Fangirl, and we're here to talk about dragons. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, we're here to talk, obviously, about elves, but I was told... Um, I have to talk about dwarves as well. And uh, yeah, I'm excited uh, to be back in your channel. And uh, yeah. Excellent. So uh, we will talk about dwarves. We will also talk about elves for a little while. Do not worry. Um, Helen is a, an elf apologist. So uh, apologies in advance to everyone for all of the uh, elf propaganda that which will be coming. Uh, but um, as as uh, as with all of these live streams during uh, both the two seasons that I'm covering, this is in aid of Alzheimer's care and research. It is an immensely worthwhile charity. If uh, if you have a little bit of money uh, to spare, please do uh, consider donating. The donate button should be somewhere on your screen right now. Um, every little bit will help. Uh, so if you're enjoying it, then please do click on that. But first, just as a, a broad intro, Helen, you've seen the first two episodes, as we all have. Did you like it? What did you think? Um, well, you know I love numbers. Um, so uh, am I allowed to give it a uh, X out of 10? And you all, I don't know, I don't even know if you rated it like that, but I, I would give it, in hindsight, a week after I've seen it, a uh, six out of 10 or 5.5 .5 out of 10. Um, and I've seen it three times now. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I actually, the funny thing is the plots I thought I'm like meh about or not really interested in are the plots I really enjoy. Like the Southlands, I really enjoy and Mea culpa to, you know, all my followers who love me for my elven law and dwarf bashing. I really enjoy the dwarf scenes um, and uh, Elrond and the dwarves. And I think we're going to talk about that if, if you do a review of one and two and what we've seen so far. And I really uh, enjoyed the dynamic between the two. I couldn't imagine it from the um, material we got so far. Uh, from the marketing material but yeah those are actually the two plots i enjoy the most and the plots that are related to the law knowledge you and i and others have i'm a bit well not concerned but some good some bad things yeah i mean i think i think i'm broadly with you i'm resisting giving marks out of 10 um but i think that the the things that i was not expecting to like were the southlands plot and i thought actually i kind of liked it in, in terms of from a kind of a tolkien law geek perspective not just in hey this is cool mysterious magic sword uh illicit romance orcs i liked that side but also from a Hey, so this is this is what Mordor was like before Sauron took over. How could Sauron take over? What's that story? I'd not ever really thought about it, and and I liked it. So I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed the the Harfoots. I wasn't sure whether I was going to enjoy the Harfoots. I definitely really enjoyed that, um, and the dwarves. Uh, I have many thoughts about the dwarf uh, story, but. Um, Kaza Doom as uh, as a visual uh, and also as an audio, I thought the, the the music there was amazing, but as a as a visual was absolutely astonishing. And um, I, I and I'm, life I, in Kaza Doom, you know, finally life yes. because all we've seen so far in the OG movies was you know it was rather sad because Gimli discovered you know. Or yeah, well, he, the the downfall of a civilization basically, and everybody was dead, and now we see life there, which is so cool. 
Yes, absolutely. And and there's uh, just as a sort of a random anecdote on it, I just thought about this. So if you it will excuse the digression, um, I was, many of you will know, lucky enough a week and a bit ago to go to the premiere of this, which was the first two episodes. And it was only this kind of swanky uh, cinema in, in central London. And there, it was very clear there were two levels to this. There was... Um, the top level was where all the, the stars were, where the special guests were. And then there was the bottom level, um, which was where I was and the other uh, people. that you, I was literally at the back row, almost at the end, along with the TikTokers and me. And it was just like where the naughty kids were. But we snuck in and it was good. Um, but it was, it was very clear the top level uh, were quite understandably so. They'd been working on this thing for three years, whatever, uh, mm. they were quite excitable. And when a new character came on, round of applause, a few whoops, uh, and all the way through this, whenever a character did something exciting, whenever there was a, a new person introduced, there was a, a round of applause and happiness from above. The, the lower level, which I would probably say were mostly kind of Tolkien fans, we were just the people who were invited to sort of come along and, and experience this. Um, only twice, only twice uh, was there a sort of a reaction um, in in the cinema, which was fascinating. And actually, I'd, I'd be intrigued, Helen. What if you had to guess which two moments was there a, like a a spontaneous uh, gasp slash round of applause from the first two episodes? Well, I imagine that that was me, literally. I think when the door shut, uh, you know, when they shut the door in front of um, Elrond and uh, Celebrimbor's face. Is that one? I, not quite, but what? nearly. So one of them was about khazad One of them was, uh, which is what got me thinking about this, there was a spontaneous round of applause when khazad appeared. And it was okay. it was just so noticeable as like it wasn't like a character or anything else. It was just oh, oh okay. actually, you know what? That's good. I like that. Um, and yeah. and I thought that was. And the other one, uh, I won't sort of make you guess. The other one was, if you remember, in that intro little bit when Sauron appeared, um, yeah. and it was like oh, wasn't expecting Sauron to appear, and that yeah. also got a little bit of a, a gasp and oh, exciting. Um, but the dwarfs as a whole which is where yeah. I started this. Um, I, I really enjoyed that. It was the the, the elf lore bit that I was um, less keen on myself. Yeah. We, we'll definitely unpick some of that uh, in, in a moment. Uh, but I would love to know, if you're watching this live, um, uh, I would love to know what your, your initial overall thoughts are, and I will happily read out a few of them. Uh, Nerd of the Rings. Hi there, Matt in the chat saying totally makes sense. Kazadoom looks incredible. Yeah, that was uh, it, it was a general feeling. Kazadoom was, I think, the best looking thing in the whole uh, the whole first couple of episodes. I'm really looking forward to Numenor. Um, uh, but yeah, very much looking forward to uh, seeing that. Uh, let's go to a question though. On well, as always. I'm framing, framing this around questions from my patrons. Uh, Diego Godoy saying, Hola, Robert and the Clueless Fangirl. Hola. Uh, I enjoyed the first two episodes, except for the part where Celebrimbor says that he must have his tower built in a short period of time mm. without giving further justification for it. Do you think the reason for this will be explained in any regard? Helen, do you, do you have a reason for why Celebrimbor needs his tower and forge built in three months? Well, the thing is, it felt so off because just before that scene, right, you had all the, you know, you had literally the king of the elves and we're going to talk about that concept because he was just the high king of the Noldor. So I was a bit confused about that as well, but we can talk about that later. But so the king basically sent, you know, one of his greatest warriors and generals off to because he said, well, there's peace now. So and then you got that scene of him very urgently wanting to build that power. Yes, he explained. I think he said um, 
we now need to preserve, which is very hinting at if you know what, for example, Galadriel's ring does, right? So he hinted at, okay, this is time of peace now. Now we need to preserve. That's what Celebrimbo said. But it's weird, you know, the, the king proclaims there's peace now. Evil has gone uh, from this world. And why the urgency then? So my thinking was, was Anatar already there and we're going to see it in a flashback has he already whispered in Celebrimbo's ear you know um th that that would be my only explanation because in times of peace why do you why is there urgency especially for elves you know everything can take forever for elves what th there's no urgency yeah and that's in in the chat as well trevor card saying Celebrimbo needs the tower built quickly because he has a friend named anatar whispering yeah his ear. <laughs> pretty much what yeah, you just yeah. said um yeah. yeah i i found this a little bit um uh, actually chris k nfl saying keller brimbo saw hs2's construction time that that's a british joke i got it uh and was like now nah, build it now <laughs> uh so um yeah there's a there's a few people um out there who think perhaps anatar who is sauron in disguise um is already there behind the yeah. scenes. We will get onto this in a little bit. Who is Sauron? Because Sauron is clearly the big baddie of, of the Lord of the Rings, and he's clearly going to be the big baddie of this show. Uh, this is the second age show. The second age big baddie is Sauron. And yeah. he's absent for the first bit of the second age, but then he appears as Anatar in hiding sexy Sauron of fair hue as, uh, as Tolkien <laughs> you said uh, described him. But we're all looking around for who this Sauron character may be, but maybe he's there already behind the scenes and we just yeah. do not know. Um, so yeah, I think that's a, a really interesting uh, shout out. Um, I, I, I gen genuinely, other than that, I can't think of any good reason why something mm -hmm. has to be done in because he's very clear that he doesn't really know what this is going to be used for, um, yeah. or at least he's not willing to admit what it's going to be used for. It, it's If there was a, because this has to be done at a certain, when the stars align in a certain way, maybe yeah. I could understand that. Yeah. That kind of works. And we do have, moving across to a different bit of the plot, we definitely do have a kind of a star theme going on. So maybe yeah. that's it. But we haven't yeah. really had any clues other than that, that this has to happen at a certain time. But um, that could also be Anatar's influence, because imagine that could be a part of the magic he uses, right? Um, so that could not come from the elves or Celebrimbo, but that could also come from Anata, who needs this, I don't know, this was Morgoth's 900 millionth birthday or whatever, you know, I don't know. Um, but it could be something Anata also whispered in his ear, astronomically uh, related. Yeah, or maybe not even... Anatar, maybe Anatar arrives later. Maybe there's some lackey who's in there. The the, the forces of evil have been quiet, but that yeah. doesn't mean that they've completely disappeared. Maybe yeah. there is somebody there who's already working behind the scenes. I, I mean, I don't know. Um, uh, Nerd of the Rings, by the way, any if anyone doesn't know Nerd of the Rings, do go and check out Matt's channel. Excellent channel. And I think doing a watch, a live watch party yeah, while the show is time. airing. So please do yeah. go and uh, check that out. One of the, uh, wherever your chat is, I'm sure one of my moderators will put a link to that in there. Uh, so do uh, check out uh, Nerd of the Rings. Excellent. Um, saying perhaps they're seeing the decay of their realms already and want to stop that happening. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, a, that's another way of, I mean, I guess a lot of this depends on how we view Celebrimbo. Is yeah. he is he a kind-hearted person to start with who just gets sort of seduced by the evil Anatar later on? Or is he at heart um, trying to be uh, uh, greater and, and power-hungry? I mean, you, you're shaking and nodding your head to these things, Helen. I don't know quite, quite which way you're going on this one. My take on Celebrimbo, based on what I've read from Tolkien, is he's actually a good-hearted person. 
And yes, he was taken in. Yes, he was misled. But um, the the proof for this, as far as I can see, is that Tolkien sets him up in opposition to Feanor, his grandfather. Feanor is the great elven smith. He created the Silmarils. And all the way through, we're invited to compare Celebrimbor to Feanor. And Celebrimbor, for anyone who's read the Silmarillion will know, he hated the idea that somebody else could have the Silmarils, his greatest creation. He turned the world upside down trying to get them. Celebrimbor, once he'd realized he'd been fooled, gave up his greatest creations in order to save them, which is a, a very opposite kind of perspective. And we don't know huge amounts about how, I, I'll let you reply in a moment, Helen, I can see you're, you're chomping at the bit, but uh, <laughs> we don't know huge amounts about how ring magic worked, but it does seem to be a part of you gets put into this. This is certainly what happened with Sauron and the one ring. Part of you gets put into these rings. So, the rings that were forged with Sauron and Celebrimbor together, they have this kind of evilness to them, the the, the, the nine, the seven, the, and, and the one that Sauron himself created. But the three that Celebrimbor himself alone, outside of any other influence, created, they were good. And I think that that tells us a bit about the heart of who Celebrimbor is. So my take is that he starts out as a good person, but is just naive and tricked. But uh, Helen, what's your what's your overall take on Celebrimbor? Well, the thing is, we have different versions of him as well, due to our Lady Galadriel, because there are so many versions of her. So there is one version of Celebrimbor basically not starting off as a good well we don't know his his beginnings um but but how he starts off is actually taking um over a region from her so there is one version of the story um where galadriel and Celeborn, by the way where's Celeborn anyway um but where they found a region right and then he is just a smith there and then him and the Guaita Mirdain they take over from them it's basically a rebellion um and um they take over Galadriel disappears she leaves her husband there to you know still keep an eye on Celebrimbo and then he gets what you say his redemption arc but I do think we see this version because and I also do think the curse of the Noldor and especially on Feanor's family is upon him. He's his last living descendant. And I I wouldn't agree with you. I would say he he's not bad, bad, bad right now. Um, but but he's not a goodie. And they, they portrayed him, everything he said was so ambitious. Um, even the way he told this story, you know, which I love by the way, about the hammer. Um, I, I, I don't think he's, he's a good, I think, and this is so cool because we now have three dimensional elves finally. Um, and I, I think he's a, he's a bit shady and we don't know in the beginning. And then he gets at the end, he gets his redemption up with the forging of the three rings and then him spoiler for everybody dying. But I do think we will see the, the curse of the Nolda is up upon him or the curse of Fiano's family. And um, he mentions him literally in his first sentence. So that must mean he carries on that legacy. For me, you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think show Celebrimble will be a different thing to book Celebrimble. I think that they're, that they're setting him up. I mean, certainly the casting, first of all, um, I've seen a few people in the chat mention it. He is, he's older visually he looks older than than you would expect him to particularly vis-a-vis say Galadriel um but he is clearly Charles Edwards is an excellent actor and yes. hopefully we're gonna, we, we've seen a little bit of this already but but there's a lot of subtlety and nuance in in yeah. how he uh he brings that character alive one thing I would highlight I, I said this in my breakdown video but I think it's definitely worth mentioning again I one of the bits I loved most about this interaction was with Feanor's hammer. And yeah. we get Elrond coming in, and uh, there's a little bit of exposition, but Elrond, clearly he's like, he goes up to the hammer, he, he 
dare not even touch it. He's he's like, what a legendary thing! How is yeah. it that such a thing could cause so much beauty and so much, and and he's like, it, it's a almost like a relic to him. Yeah. And then Celebrimbo comes, picks it up, and he's just like wiping off a little bit of dust, and he's sort of playing around with it, and he clangs it back down. Again. <laughs> to him, it's it's a tool. This is a thing yeah. which he uses. It's not a relic. It's not a thing to be admired from afar. This is, I am absolutely convinced he will be using this to be making those rings. Um, having set this up, this is a thing that he intends to use. Um, so uh, I, I thought that was a really interesting way of showing the difference between their two characters. Elrond at this stage certainly is very theoretical. He's very much loving yeah. the beauty of things. And Celebrimbor is very much about the practicality, about how yeah. you use certain items. Do you question for you? Do you think, because I found it so awkward when you remember, again, as I said, Celebrimbo being the last living descendant of Fëanor, who partly, you know, due um, well to the oath he made his family and his son swear, is responsible for Elrond's you know, parents, well, not death, they are not really dead, but, you know, him him growing up as an orphan, basically, and his brother. Um, do, do you think, will they, will this be included? Because, yes, I know the right situation, I know appendices, uh, but y y they apparently have additional material. So do you think this will be introduced this this part of his his heritage his parents because if we see you know descendants of his brother and Numenor if Numenor is introduced they must in a way explain what Numenor is where it came from so do do, do we, will we get this weird vibe between Elrond and Celebrimbor or <laughs> I mean, I don't know. For, for those who don't know about this rights issue, the, the uh, at a very high level, I've given up trying to understand exactly where oh, yeah, the right I... these, these <laughs> things lie. But at a very high level, when they were developing this show, uh, the showrunners had uh, the rights to The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, and that includes the appendices to The Lord of the Rings. And again, at a very high level, the appendices to The Lord of the Rings were what Tolkien did when he got told he couldn't publish all of the Silmarillion. He kind of squashed it down into a condensed version and put it there as, as appendices to The Lord of the Rings. So they've got the condensed version, but there's a lot which is missing, which is in Silmarillion. The intro bit that we got to episode one of The Rings of Power, if you're a Tolkien nerd, you will have spotted lots of things that made you go, hang on a moment, that's not exactly what happened. And those things are, are largely, in my view, because they did not have the rights to them. They, they did not have the rights to all of what was in the Silmarillion. Now, this is an issue because... Elrond, for, uh, again, as sort of background for Elrond, for Elrond, for those who don't know, he has a twin brother, and the two of them in the Silmarillion, back in the, the First Age, when they were still young, um, their, their parents uh, went off for very good reason, but they went off, and they got captured by... Um, let's say Celebrimbor's uncles <laughs> um, is probably the easiest way of saying it. Um, mm. And there was this kind of weird talking, doesn't really go into all of the details, but first of all, they were definitely captives, but they did develop some kind of a bond there um, because they did capture them, but also kind of looked after them. So there is a weird dynamic there. That didn't come out. I didn't feel it came out in... No. The the dialogue that we had between Elrond and Celebrimbor on the show, I suspect they're not going to go down that route because I don't think that will okay. add much to the action that they're wanting to show. It mm -hmm. will be interesting to see, when you're talking about Numenor, Elrond's twin brother is the first king of Numenor. So Elrond yeah. had the choice, do you want to live as a, an elf or a human? He said, I want to be an elf. And so yeah. he's lived the elf life. His brother said, I want to be a human, lived the human life. And he went off to be the first king of Numenor. So I don't, they may get around that bit by not having Elrond have much to do with Numenor. That's yeah. the easiest way of doing it. I, I th Certainly that seems to be how they're setting it up in season one, what we've seen so far from the trailers. Yeah. 
Galadriel, we've seen her in the trailers go to Numenor. We've not seen Elrond go there. So maybe that's how they're going to yeah. be working their way through that. Yeah. Although we saw, um, we didn't see that in episode one and two, maybe in three now or in whatever episode's coming. Uh, Miriel has a line saying, we fought... I don't know who she's actually talking. I forgot who she's talking to, but she said, you know, we fought for our ride to rule or something like that. So she must talk about the past of Numenor and how Numenor came to be. But yeah, you, you might be right. It might be a hint that not Elrond is going there, which I would have found so cool because there must be some statues of his brother there. Um, and it would be a nice homage. And I always imagined before the show came out, before anything, I always imagined he must have gone there. In all those 3,400 years, Elrond must have gone. Because we know the elves did ship to Romena very, very often. Um, and especially the elves from Linden. Um, and that was in the beginning where Elrond lived, right? So I, I do think... And they learned a lot from Kirdan. Kirdan and Elrond were close and Gilgalad. So I do think in my head canon, he was in Numenor. So maybe you're right. Maybe that hints that she's going there, that they're not talking about that. We'll see. I'm not mad about it. I'm, I'm not angry about it. Yeah, I mean, I don't think this... There are huge gaps. It has to be said, there are huge gaps in a lot of the Second Age that Tolkien did yeah. leave there quite deliberately a lot of the time. And that does leave room for... We do not know if Elrond ever went to Numenor. It's just not said. Uh, no. So maybe he did... Maybe he didn't. We we don't know. Uh, Men of the West is in the chat. Um, yes. uh, hi there, Euston. Uh, a bit of a legend around these parts. Uh, and thank you very much for uh, the uh, the donation. I hugely appreciated. Uh, for those who don't know, another excellent Tolkien uh, um, YouTube channel. And uh, I don't know whether he's the OG uh, Tolkien YouTube I channel, but so. certainly one of the OGs. Yeah. And uh, yeah. you will struggle to find a single other person in our community who will not give Yoiston the respect that he's due. So hat tip to you, sir. Uh, fantastic to have you there in the chat. Um, let's go to, um, what should we talk about? Let, let's talk about dwarves. I know you've been dying to talk about the dwarves. So let's uh, let's start Literally. talking about the dwarves first. We'll get onto the elves <laughs> in just one moment. Um, George R. R. Tolkien says, Salutations, <laughs> I the Salutations name. to you. That I, that I always trip over that name. I have to say it very, yeah. very slowly. Uh, <laughs> the first two episodes were amazing and only left me wanting for more. I'm glad you enjoyed them. I'm curious to see what the dwarves have that they are being so secretive about. Is it possibly a Silmaril? It's probably Mithril, but I'm staying optimistic. Um, so... Let's go. Actually, he just go, says off topic. What did you think of uh, of Damon? Um, this fandom is purely it's just truly blessed. I, I will give you this is a a Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power live stream. But Helen, I know you're also a fan of of um, House of the Dragon. What's your what's your thirty second view on that before we, we we talk about this one? What what do you think of House of the Dragon? Oh my god, I did ten out of ten, and apparently it's just getting better. Uh, no, I really enjoy it. I loved it. I'm not one of these angry season eight people, um, so I was excited for it, you know, all along. Um, I I don't like comparing these shows because I think it's it's so different. Yes, obviously Martin is a big fan, and he had something to say about the show. For me, it's two complete different things, um, and I enjoy both. But yeah, I definitely, definitely enjoy it. Excellent. I also enjoy it. Um, so uh, do check it out. Um, just uh, Kolnitsky in the in the chat saying Helen loves dwarves because she's only five foot tall. I <laughs> would not wish to comment on that. Helen is a giant in my eyes. Uh, but let's go to uh, the uh, um, how, how the, tall I am? F five four, right? Five foot four. I just I do mean, European... if you're standing on something, maybe. What? Um, the, 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 let's let's go to what is in that box. So the dwarves we've already talked about, Kazadin, which is amazing, but. But at the at the end of episode two, Durin Junior goes to Durin Senior. That's a whole different issue. Maybe we'll come on to that later. But he so he goes to his dad, and his dad's there going, uh, but surely the elves know about our big secret. And then they open the box, and it's a bit like you know, the pulp fiction thing where the light shines up at them. <laughs> um, do, what what 
what do you think? I mean, this could be a lot of different things. The obvious answer, as George R. R. Tolkien was saying, is Mithril. We know that they discover Mithril underneath Khazadum at some point. We know that this is the source of a lot of their um, their wealth and their power. Is it that, or could it be a Silmaril? What What do you think? I mean, Celebrimbo, which is a bit weird, Celebrimbo mentioned the Silmaril, right? Um, so that I did find right from the get-go. Um, so I did find that a bit odd. And he was very, you know, OG Durin or Durin the Third, father, whatever. Um, he um he was very much he he I mean, it's not like he he showed his hate for the dwarf. He was very curious about Elrond in specific. He was very intri- He was very like, oh, do you think this is really a coincidence? He came now that we found it. But do you really think we know where the three Silmarils went? One is in the sky still, so that is not available. One was thrown into a volcano, so I don't I don't see any. They must have digged it up in Moria, right? That that would be my conclusion. And um, because they were just talking about there was a lot of work in Moria, you know, in those 20 years, a lot has happened. The city grew, blah, blah, blah. So I think they digged it up. So, and the other one was thrown into the sea. So it doesn't make sense for it to be a Silmaril. So I would say it's Mithril. But Mithril is very important and it can, it it could change wars right if if your army is wearing mithril um obviously you're you you have an advantage and all these things or you can sell it and make you know good coins i i, I do think it's mithril i couldn't see any how oh, yeah no mithril <laughs> well i i hope it's mithril um that's my my general take the the silver i would have said absolutely not the silmarils at other than the fact that they introduced them just before that. They talked about them, Elrond mentions the Silmarils, then Celebrimbo talks about the Silmarils, and that was a lot of talk about the Silmarils for something which is nothing to do with this show. Um, I personally hope it's not a Silmaril. I I would agree with you that if it is, it's the one that went into the earth, into sort of the the fiery cracks uh, of, of... whatever it was, and the, the dwarves dug it up. I mean, I think there's there are two reasons why I don't want it to be. And I don't know. I've got absolutely no inside information on this at all. Um, but, I mean, I think the first one is that I think Tolkien wrote that story, and I think he, he ended up putting the Silmarils where they thematically should end up, one in the sky, yeah. one in the sea, one in the earth. And yeah. that is that's the, the ending of that story. And he replaced them with the rings then in the second age. Exactly. So then come the rings and the rings take center stage. So I I want that to be the end of that story. The the idea of there suddenly being a Silmaril is discovered and then this is an important plot point in the next uh, age doesn't, because Tolkien didn't write about, there was no hint of that, there was nothing there. So that doesn't quite work for me. And the second thing from a kind of a, a dwarf apologist perspective would be <laughs> the I know suspicious her, huh? but one of the things that the showrunners uh, have said that has always impressed me. I'm still holding them to account on this is that they wanted to give the dwarf culture a dignity that it's not had from previous adaptations, mm. which, and, and I think most Tolkien fans would agree that a, a lot as great as other adaptations have been, the, the dwarves have tended, particularly in the Peter Jackson films, they've, they've been the joke. They've been yeah. Gimli's there. He's been burping. He's been, uh, there's been height jokes about him. There's been lots of, Always, he's he's the the the. I know you can understand and empathise, Helen, <laughs> um, but it's the uh, always the butt of the joke. And what they said was that they wanted to show us dwarf culture at its height. Yeah. Um, I personally think, given the fact that what the height of dwarf power and cultural influence came through Mithril, if you were to say that only exists in some way because they happened to discover an ancient elf artifact 
kind of undermines yeah. what the, the 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 dignity of the dwarfen achievement. So um, I hope not is my answer. Maybe they have gone that, down that route. Maybe they're going to have a really good explanation I've not thought of. But at the moment, my hope yeah. is that this is not a Silmaril. And, and I do think because that would actually make this whole plot negative, it would show again and focus on the greed for the Silmarils. And again, that was First Age or even before the First Age, right? Um, so I, I, I don't want them to focus any longer on the Silmarils. As I said, the Second Age is the Age of the Rings. Um, and the rings, the three rings, symbolize and replace the three Silmarils in a lot of ways, actually. Um, and so I don't want the dwarves again to be so, oh my God, I can't believe I'm saying this, but, you know, <laughs> being like greedy because that would mean they, the Silmaril doesn't belong to them. But if you see the reaction of Durin's father or Durin, um, he was very protective of whatever they found and very suspicious of the elves, but he must know, actually, this belongs to the elves, right? Um, so that would make them greedy and put them in a negative light. And I don't, I don't want to see that, you know, I mean, the whole now Glamir thing is over now. Let's not talk about it anymore. So I, I don't want that actually, uh, but I had a really cool theory about it and hear me out. What about it is some material, maybe something like Mithril. And Celebrimbo needs it and knew and heard of this. And this is why he asks for Elrond. Um, this is material he needs to forge the rings or he needs for his forge. Um, what do you think? So there could be rumors, you know, I mean, the dwarves do travel and all that. Maybe somebody spilled some secrets and was like, yeah, you know, we found this, whatever it is. Um, and Celebrimbo was, oh, wait a moment, or maybe Sauron even told him this, right? Um, and this is material he needs. And this is the whole, I mean, okay, you're not very convinced of this, okay? No, no, I am convinced. Uh, the, the, uh, the only thing is I don't think we need an extra material. If we've got Mithril already. Maybe and, it's Mithril, yeah. And and we know that uh one of the three rings that Celebrimbo, that the three elven rings that Celebrimbo forged was out of yes. Mithril. That's Elrond's yeah. ring was made for the Mithril. So yeah. at some point he will get that. Um, so I don't see the need for anything new and, and additional. This is, this is one, I don't think we need to um, reinvent the wheel here. I think that we've got the ingredients here for a, a good plot already. Um, just quickly, uh, Andrew Kay saying the visuals of Casa Doom are fantastic, but some of the actions, demeanor, and chants were a bit less serious. Hope the hope the dwarves would get more of an edge in the Rings of Power. Yeah, I mean, I think I would. Um, I mean, I'm not a big fan of the rock smashing competition, um, which was a a new thing for that they they made up there. I wasn't also a big fan of the inventing this dwarves are angry with Elrond thing that was that was new um so uh, that yeah. I I'm willing to forgive a lot because Casa Doom looks amazing and because frankly one of my favorite scenes is that that Durin and Deesa and Elrond scene I think I think that that family it, the, the warmth there was yeah. fantastic I loved that that added a whole load of extra um level of emotion to what we've had which a lot of it the the relationships were quite transactional that actually felt like a family so I was yeah. I, I loved that that I thought that was really good and I love the tree symbolism that they brought the tree even to the dwarves because we know how important, you know, Galadriel gives out the seeds to Sam. Um, the, this whole tree symbolism, the, the Numenorians got the trees, right? Um, and this is so, so, such an importance. Um, and I really love that the dwarves have it now and that it's so important for Durin to nurture it and to try to grow it even in, you, you be, because we know of how hard it is to grow them, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I really like that. And shout out to the dragon helmet of Dorlomen and Turin Turamba, that poor sword. Um, I loved when the kids, you know, were running around there and playing with these helmets. Um, and it was literally the dragon helmet. That's, you know, for us geeks, it's, it's a nice... Um, 
it was, it was absolutely. And um, uh, jo Jokin Hagar saying, my only complaint is the lack of dwarf beards. Um, and this is picking up Dan McKay uh, also saying, am I alone in wishing that dwarf women had beards? Um I mean, this is this is a long-running dispute in in the <laughs> Lord of the Rings <laughs> fandom. Um, I, I mean, I think just in terms of what we saw, I think that if you if you squinted, you would see there was a bit of facial hair going on there. But clearly, yeah. it wasn't a it yeah. wasn't a full beard going on. Um, now, I did do a video, a part of a video, ages ago, asking the question: Do dwarf women have beards? And I think I came to the conclusion. Yes, uh, that um, that is largely based on what Gimli said, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I I think I would generally agree. I, this isn't a deal breaker for me. I I, I thought. But you also think Balrogs well. have no wings, so you're wrong. Well, Balrogs have no wings. That's just a fact. They, you bet um, they do. But, but they do. They, they don't. Know they, let's not get into the bell. We, let's. Uh, we've seen a Balrog in the trailer, so we will be talking about Balrogs later yeah. in the season. I am yeah. absolutely sure. I have many, many thoughts about Balrog things. <laughs> uh, if that, the, my pithy summary though: if Balrogs have wings, they always forget to use them. That's just a, a just. A if they show they, okay, if they show him with wings, you owe me a dinner. You well, had it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Balrogs have a habit, not just in the Lord of the Rings, but also in the Silmarillion, of falling off of great heights and dying. If they it's had like wings, penguins have wings. It's like penguins have wings. It's just so. Not to okay, look you heard more it here first. Clueless fangirl thinks that Balrogs have penguin wings. Um, <laughs> but anyway, we've got uh, so dwarf, dwarf beards. I was a bit disappointed, but I mean, this isn't a, a this isn't a, a game changer for me personally um but let's talk about Gilgalad. now uh we've got a question from mary francis angelini saying um i was wondering about your thoughts on the show's portrayal of Gilgalad. i know it's early in the story arc but it doesn't seem to match what i've read granted i might be thinking about stuff which the showrunners don't have the rights to especially the letter to aldarion but it feels off uh, thanks for both of you for all the great and thoughtful comments on your channels. Now, I, I, I think I said um, on Twitter actually um, that this was the thing I, I disliked the most. Um, I like to focus on the positive on this channel. I like to talk about the things that I enjoy, uh, but the the whole area around Gil Gallad and his character, the acting was fine. I'm not not dissing the actor in the slightest. Yeah. But the, the the characterization and also the we'll cover this as well in this section. I think the uh, the access to Valinor issue did not work for me. I think you share my views on this one, Helen. Do you um, you promised you wouldn't rant? But um, this is a, a, a small <laughs> a small moment for you to give your views on the characterization of Gilgalad. Well, the the thing is, I mean, I I do think they what what they want to do is give all the elves because we didn't actually have that because due to Tolkien's writing, maybe for the third age, um, for the elves we have seen so far on you know screen adaptions, um, they were not three dimensional, right? Um, and I do think they want because you saw in that scene where Gilgalad finds that, uh. Sorry, I'm a bit slow today. That leaf, leaf, leaf is the word, right? The leaf, yeah. That the rotten uh, leaf. Um, so I think then it literally, you can see it clicking in his head and he's like, oh, damn, I think I made a mistake. First of all, sending my, one of my best warriors, shipping her off to, to the undying lands. Um, and then also, um, okay, maybe she was right all along and evil is back or has always been here. Um and I, I do think they want to give him that kind of story arc, that that would be my interpretation. But him handing out tickets to going to the Undying Lands is so wrong because the, and command, actually commanding people her to go there. Like, who is he to command Galadriel? First of all, she's, in, in my view, she's older than him. She's 
I think ahead of uh, not ahead of him um uh, above him in in rank is that can you say above him in rank yeah you can yeah and um so I was very confused about that whole dynamic that she needs to ask for an audience to speak to him or that the the whole thing that he is the high king or the king of apparently now all of middle earth because it's weird why is he commanding the southlands we can talk about the southlands later but arondia seems to be under his command and um you know according to the law it is very important to distinguish between teleri elves and or Sinda elves who belong to the teleri and the people of gilgalad who are noldor and actually you see that in thranduil and in legolas and their 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 ancestor um Orofa, who was at that time second age who was king of the cinder elves and um he commanded these elves so it, it is it is very weird that apparently he is but we have the whole law about Thranduil. I, I mean, this exists already, right? So about Thranduil and um, Orofa and uh, Legola. So it, it, I, I'm, I'm very confused about the Gilgalad character, how he is being set up as king, first of all. Um, so his role, but then also his his character, because he was the one who was so foresighted in year 500 of the second age, again, second age, 3,400 years long, he wrote a letter, and I know they don't have the rights to that specific letter, but this is his character, right? How Tolkien wanted him to be. He was so foresighted that he always knew evil has not gone um, from this world. And he he aided, he asked the Numenorians for aid. He sent a letter asking, can, you know, can we forge an alliance? Um, would you be willing to help me? He warned the Numenorians of the rising evil in the East. Um, so he knew all this, and now they take that away from from this character, and he's a bit clueless. And that I find that weird. But maybe this is because you can't have him and Galadriel having that role. You need somebody, one of the main character elves, to get turned around, you know, to due to events and things happening, learning, ah, okay, she was right all along. Is that it? Is this due to I Galadriel? Mean, I, I think this is where the showrunners are going with this, is that they wanted Galadriel to be the main protagonist. Um, I think that much is reasonably clear. She's the introduction to the world for us. Um, and they had to have somebody for her to... Um, have some kind of tension with that she's desperately trying to find Sauron. If everyone else was around her going, yes, let's, you should go and find Sauron, then that wouldn't be much of a story. So I can understand why, um, personally. I can also mm -hmm. kind of understand why they uh, they didn't specifically say he's the king of all elves. They kind of fudged that a bit, but the clear implication is it. I kind of understand because it would get a bit complicated. There's lots of different elves, and they clearly decided not to show the difference between the Noldor elves or and any other elves. This was just like, and the elves came across from Valinor. So I kind of understand all of that. But I agree with you completely. Gilgalad, in, in the books, is the foresighted one who was there before anyone else. He's yeah. the one who says there's a shadow rising there in the south. And these, and even Tolkien makes it clear, he even like identifies it too early before other people can really see that there's a problem. So none of them were actually, the, the Numenorians go, well, I can't see much. Yeah. So they don't get too excited about it. So he's, he's that far ahead of everyone else. So that yeah. kind of... Um, that didn't work for me. I think the thing was that there were three things. We'll get on to the access to Valinor in a moment because I think that's a slightly separate issue. But I think there are three things here with Gilgalad that I didn't, that I thought made him look like he was not wise. He, I, if they'd just done him, made him do one of these things, I could have accepted it. So, first of all, there's the, um, the issue of Celebrimbor. Now, Perhaps at this stage we do not, you know, even Gil Galad doesn't know that Gil Celebrimbor's about to go off and create something which is going to cause all the troubles. But 
that's not that is not showing foresight sending elrond off to go and help the thing which is to create the thing which will create the, the rings of power that is not foresight so he's he's not shown it um secondly he's uh he's called uh, declared the time of peace it's not even uh the that he's like not there being foresighted seeing things he said it's all okay now everything's yeah. fine and he's calling the troops back from wherever they are stationed yeah. looking for evil again not showing wisdom and foresight and then thirdly we get this sending off galadriel issue which um now he he came up with a justification for this uh, which was you know something along the lines of sometimes the wind that tries to blow out a flame actually just fans the flame which I kind of understand, and in worlds, okay, fine, if that's where they're wanting to go. But, I mean, for me, I think this fairly obviously is going to be a plot line where him sending Galadriel off actually is the thing which causes the, the issue. This is him sending her off means that she's then in the right place for her to be fanning the flames of, of the return of evil. If he'd said, no, go back up north, head even further north, beyond that very north bit there of the front of which we were, she would have been out of all of this. And I, she would not have been fanning the flames of evil. So, But actually, he could send her to Numenor. He could be the one. She could yeah. sh still have her shipwrecking scene. She could still have all that. But he could be foresighted. Because, look, who founded the White Council? It was them right it was him and galadriel they were the 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 the, the main ones who um pushed for this right um and i don't like they take this away from him and uh, he could send her to numenor and say look we need aid in this miriel could still be queen all that could still be the same like they wanted to be but he could send her it wouldn't take away from her i don't know that yeah um yeah, so uh, and Vidaf in the chat saying the generous way of interpreting show Gilgalad is that he declared peace in order to lure Sauron out of hiding, but if so, he should have discussed it with Gladriel. Yeah, so I'm yeah. with all of these things, we're only two episodes in. So I am yeah. I'm willing to to give the showrunner some flexibility here. Maybe they've yeah. got a plot that I just I've not seen, that I don't know where it's going. Yeah. Maybe Gilgalad is actually cleverer than we all know and what looks a bit stupid is actually very wise we just don't realize it yet so yeah maybe that's where we're going to go i'm holding fire a little bit on this but on the first two episodes those were the things i didn't like um very quick pause uh, just to remind people if you are enjoying this live stream uh, if you would like to show your appreciation for the live stream or just support an incredibly worthy cause uh this is uh as are all of my live streams on in during the season, in support of Alzheimer's care and research. If you have got a little bit of spare cash, if you can afford it, if you're feeling generous, please, 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 there's a link somewhere. Uh, please do uh, donate. We're at, uh, where are we at at the moment? 5,000, no, no, 5,000, 2,700. Um, if we can get that close to 3,000 by the end of this stream, I will be very, very happy. So uh, thank you very much. I know a lot of people, I haven't been able to shout out everyone who's been uh, donating, but thank you very much. I, I do very much appreciate it. Um, so let's get the other thing off of my chest that, that I was... Uh, uh, disliked about this episode in, in particular, or the first two episodes in particular, and then we can move on to things that we we liked, which was this access to Valinor issue. I know has um, uh, annoyed you a little bit as well. So, what happened on the show is that so as we saw, Galadriel arrives back. Then there's this kind of ceremony thing, and Gilgalad announces, "I am giving you the gift of going to Valinor." Uh, and everyone's excited. Um, and then he says, right, everyone go up to Kirdan and then get on a boat and head off. Um, this is not how this works in Tolkien's Legendarium. This is not a gift of the king. This is this is home. This is where elves can go. They're all called back home. This isn't, Gilgalad isn't the gateway to this. So that for me, felt like an unnecessary change. The only reason why was to cut it, 
I, that I can see at the moment. Maybe there'll be a reason later, but the only reason I can see at the moment why they changed that is in order to get Galadriel onto a boat heading west. Um, so yeah. uh, I wasn't desperately pleased with that, but Helen, uh, yeah. have you got any nice things to say about this or are you in rant mode as well? No, no, no. I mean, the nice thing about it is that they portrayed it as you know, when you were not talking about Galadriel, but the the soldiers who were fighting with her, we don't know for how many centuries, how long that you know search and hunt for Sauron uh, and revenge of her brother's death uh, took place. But um, I like the aspect of him saying and giving them the gift of okay, you can now go to our ancestral home. This was a gift to the soldiers, right? So in a way, I can understand that, and I did actually like that but you know for talking this whole you know losing your home and leaving your home and sometimes being forbidden to go home because you know you effed up or something happened and um this whole aspect of wanting to go back and the whole resurrection there are so many christian themes but also themes you know in 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 our in our lifetime in our own history that people lose their homes you know and and can't go back for a really really long time um and that is so important to talking and they took that in a way away with him basically commanding this and giving them this gift um, and again, Galadriel was in because there are different versions, but she was actually at one point forbidden to go back. Um, and so, yeah, I'm I'm not a fan. I can understand why why they did it because I do think they don't want to go too deep into the religious topics and the whole mythology and the gods and explaining the gods explaining the Valar I think they they think that's too complicated for a start of a tv show maybe there will be spin-offs you know and we learn more about Valinor but I think they shied away from this because for the casual viewer it would be really like what is that you know the casual viewer still thinks not 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 you know not, not bashing anybody but the destruction of the ring you know it, it's this is a symbolism right and Eru intervened and it, it it's not like Frodo couldn't just throw it in and Gollum took you know no there's a whole thing behind it um and it is partly religious so I think they but but casual people don't really know that if you if you haven't read a lot about it and Tolkien's motives. So, yeah, I think they shied away from it and this is how they can portray it. Yeah, I, th I think that's probably right. And this does bring us on to Galadriel, which is what we're wanting to talk about now. AD just in the chat saying, can we give out super chats towards the charity? Yeah. Um, uh, just the in terms of uh, how this works, you cannot have both super chats and charity donations on one uh, YouTube live stream. I don't make the rules. Uh, but uh, so if you wish to super chat, please just donate to the charity. And um, if you put a question underneath that, then hopefully one of my moderators will sort of try and highlight that for me and I'll try and pick that up. Uh, so uh, yeah, treat it like a, a super chat if you wish. And I tried to pick up as many questions as I can uh, in the chat. I can't pick up everything. It does move through quite quickly, particularly when I'm talking. I'm only a Robert and I can't both speak and read at the same time, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, thank you very much. But let's talk about let's talk about Galadriel uh, quickly. Um, or in fact, actually, let's go with uh, Helen. This is a question. Uh, Mara Lee, who we, we both know, uh, asked a question specifically for you, Helen. So this is a, a question mm. she said for Helen. I know that you admire the elves in Tolkien's Legendarium. What do you think of how they've been portrayed, both on TV and in films in general and in this show in particular? So uh, how have elves been portrayed generally and on this show, do you think? Well, you know, the thing is, you know, I'm, I'm from Germany and you grew up with fairy tales, you know, and the aspect of fairy um, is partly where his whole concept of, of elves come from. So I'm, I think everybody's intrigued by this because why do we love vampires? Because of, you know, this endless life. I think a whole lot about the elves not having too many explanations, not knowing everything. We know everything about, you know, we're born, we live a life, we die, we 
some go to hell, some go to heaven. You you might think what you want. For the elves, there's a whole different concept. And I think that was always so fascinating to so many people, me including me. Um, and the thing about the third age elves, which are the elves of Tolkien we knew so far, is... They were, yeah, this is why I always say one dimensional. They didn't have a real, you know, character or, or not. There was no real hero's journey. That was Aragorn's story, right? It's not like um, Elrond ever got a hero's journey or anything like that. And this is why I love the Cimmerillion because, you know, in the first age and the ages before, there were. Um, there's more about the elves and, and we, we get a bit deeper and we learn, yes, there, there were elves who were corrupted, who were evil, um, who became evil. Um, there was kin strives amongst them. They killed each other. Um, and I really enjoy that because that goes a bit away from this mythological fairy tale, you know, elf or fairies we know. And this is why I love talking for for giving us this kind of elf and this is why i was looking forward to this show so much because we don't i mean yeah in other adaptions maybe in fantasy genre in general but i don't i mean i don't really remember one um but yeah so i really was looking forward to see three-dimensional elves um so that was why i was mainly excited for this show and I think we are seeing more three-dimensional elves. Yes, elves. we do. Yeah, yeah. And on, uh, in Peter Jackson's films, the elves are always this kind of ethereal, wise, wonderful, beautiful yeah. people. And I, I think certainly we'll... Celebrimbor seems a lot more complicated. Um, Galadriel, I, I think, is deliberately coming across, as, as I think she should, as quite proud quite headstrong um uh, and not the kind of character that we saw at the end of the third age so i mean let's get into this uh 444 was asking about uh, gladriel um first of all just a, a factual thing do we know roughly how many years Galadriel spent on her mission to try and find sauron um i think in world the answer is she said centuries past you know, centuries and centuries passed by. Elsewhere, yeah. we hear a thousand years. So that's the kind of feel we've got. About a thousand years have passed while she's been hunting for Sauron. Um, and uh, secondly, on a factual thing, is Galadriel's decision to abandon ship just reckless or are elves simply capable of swimming through vast oceans? I mean, I think they are capable of... Uh, feats of endurance beyond normal human ones, but I think even that it's would be quite impressive. Uh, she has passed beyond an elf's sight uh, away from the shore, uh, so surely hundreds of miles. So, um, yeah, that's quite tough. But let's talk and elves about... Die. Uh, elves die um, when there's hardship. Uh, they, the ones who cross the Helcaraxe, um, Tor's wife, Idril's mother, they died, there were elves dying due to hardship. It's not like maybe she wouldn't have made it, you know. She didn't... I don't think she knew if this is a sure thing. She makes it, makes it to a ship or to the shore. This was a no, I think I think the the feel that they're wanting us to have is this was a gut instinct thing uh, yes. that she's she just thought no this isn't my time I have to go back to Middle Earth I don't know how but I'm just jumping jumping out yeah. now leap of faith that, that that is the the feel I think they wanted I don't think it was a thought through hey I'll swim back home no that's uh, I mean it just she happened to come across that life raft she happened to I mean so th these things happened but it was not her thinking. Do you know what? I think I will be able no. to get back. Um, she just uh, sort of went by instinct. So, but let's talk about her character. Um, so, uh, 444 saying, I understand that Galadriel isn't the same character we saw in Lord of the Rings yet, uh, but I do not understand why she is presented as a person who can be viewed as an annoying one. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I don't know whether you'd agree with annoying uh but she is a different character um what do you what's your take on galadriel in the second age and the what i i think we're all assuming is going to be a, 
a character arc, uh, a character yes. development thing from where she is now to where she ends up at the end of the, uh, the season or the end of the second age. What's your overall take on that? Well, the thing is, you know, I um, enjoyed the first age, Galadriel, where she did learn uh, her, I, I call, I mean, let me call it witchcraft. I No, it's not witchcraft, um, but um, where she learned from Melian the Maiar, an ancestor um, of um, Luthien and therefore Aragorn and Arwen and actually also Elrond, right? And she learned from a Maiar, same rank as Gandalf and Sauron and... Um, um, Saruman, for example, she learned magic tricks, basically. And this is what she later on, you know, in the third age, in, in the movies, in the books, in the third age, um, what she can do, well, what her powers are, right? Um, so I, I don't disagree. And Tolkien always described her as rebellious. She could, um, she, she, she rode with her brothers. She, I think she fought with her brothers. I think she was capable, she was a man made, described as a man made and she was tall. She was capable of doing physical things. For me, she never was a warrior queen or a, an Amazonian Wonder Woman uh, type of character because the moment she came to Middle Earth very early on, first age, she went um, to, um, to, to the halls of uh, um, Melian's husband. Sorry. Thingle. <laughs> it's Thingle. Thingle. Thinking Thingle uh, at Doriath. Um, and she learned that there. Um, and so it's so she had her arc you know in in the in in the first age and she she just went on with this magic powers um which is also i think my, i think she was more powerful with with a magic aspect than with a sword so i don't like particularly they made her a warrior i think you could have given that to Elrond um, and I know they portray him as a politician I would have but he was a herald he he led armies for Gilgalad he was a warrior um, so I don't really like they took away this first age she learned magic she this is where her power lies we know she will end up like that in the third age but I would have preferred her to be the magic Galadriel from the third age well, I mean, I, I'm i more relaxed about this. I, I think, as you say, she was described as man-maiden. She yeah. was athletic. Um, yeah. She certainly, in one version of what Tolkien wrote, she fought in uh, the, the kinslaying at Al Um And Tolkien, in one of his letters, uh, said she is of Amazon disposition, which is like his way of saying a warrior woman. So I've got no problem with... Yeah. With her being like certainly early on before she came to Middle Earth, I think that's I, I don't think yeah. any Tolkien scholar would disagree with that. No, I think yeah. later on she uh, retains that ability. She's certainly there. Um, she's she tears down the, the walls of Dol Guldur after the the, the 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 War of the Ring. She was there on the assault on Dol Guldur um, uh, as well with the rest of the White Council. So she certainly retains those abilities. Yeah. Um, we're somewhere on that that arc is 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 where I'm I'm feeling. So yeah. I personally don't think that there's a there's a problem with with her being. A no. warrior in the second age. I don't particularly if you're using if you're saying the first age, we're squashing down to it was just a long battle, which is what they've done. So I've got no yeah. real um, problem uh, with that at all. I mean, I think, um, yeah, I think that's probably all I, I, I have to say on on the um, uh, sort of the Galadriel character arc. It, it, it's it all of this seems to be an interpretation of where you think she is on that at this point in time she started off like that she ended off like we saw Kate Blanchett where do you think yeah. she's at right now and and I'm I'm relaxed about that but I know as I say Helen you're you're obviously more on the she's further towards the Kate Blanchett version <laughs> Yeah, because you want to see her, where did she learn all that, right? Where where did the magic with the mirror and all that come from? Because what I really loved, um, and I tweeted about that, um, I, um, you know, when she spoke about the reflections in the water to her brother, 
I did, did they ever name him Finrod? Did they ever say the name? I don't, well, to, it is obviously. Finrod. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, to Fenrod. Um, and when she was talking to him and she talked about the reflection, this is the magic she later uses, you know, um, with Frodo and Sam. Um, and this is how she catches the light of Eärendil, right? And this is how she aids the fellowship. Um, so this was such a cool, I don't know if everybody catched it, but I really love that, that they um, put that in there. Um, and... <laughs> I just want, if you end up as a mage, as a witch, whatever, um, don't you want to know how that person, where, where, where did she learn this? Did she always have this? And maybe, you know, in season five or season four, we we see this and her arc is from warrior to to mage. Well, I don't know, you know, it's not a D&D &D game, so. <laughs> it's not. I mean, I, I think for, for me, the, the bigger concern actually is that Tolkien always presented her as having, uh, I mean, he never put it in quite these words, but a lust for power. Um, she eagerly desired to rule over a land of her own, we're told. And yeah. that that is the case before she came to Middle-earth. That seems to be a, a large part of what drove her to go to Middle-earth. Um, and then when she was the what you were talking about with Meli and the Maya, she seems to be learning about how you rule a land. Um, yeah. And then all the way up to the end of the third age, she finally does get to rule a land. And yeah. that character arc culminates in that fantastic moment when Frodo offers her the ring and she resists. And the whole point is that finally that lust for power, that desire to be in charge, that desire to, to rule over people, she can actually turn her back on it. And that is Galadriel's big character arc, in my mind anyway, is that this culminates in that moment. And Tolkien, in one of his versions of Galadriel, because he does have a few different versions, says that's the moment when finally she was allowed to come back to Velenor because she had overcome lust for power. And we haven't seen that from Galadriel here. She's here on this mission to try and hunt down Sauron, which is great, but it's yeah. not actually what seems to be motivating her from what we've learned from Tolkien. Uh, exactly. It, it's, yeah. it's not the kind, it's, I mean, it's not, it doesn't make for a very sympathetic character in the early, early iterations of Galadriel. She's just wanting to be ruling people and not having anyone tell her what to do it doesn't make her come across particularly well. But uh, so I can understand why they didn't put that aspect on there. But it should be there in order for the end piece to actually make sense. But you know, nobody likes a rebellious teenager girl. So I get that. <laughs> it's true. She I means she's slightly older than a teenager by this point. But you know, only, but, you only know. slightly. Um, uh, Kelly Summers. Uh, just in the chat saying, do you think we'll see more flashbacks? It seems like they're willing to talk about or show the first age as long as it's not in the present action. I think we we probably will. Um, I, I think the the yeah. emphasis they put on people like Finrod does seem to imply that there's there'll be more thinking about the past and 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 stuff like that. But this is going to be second, set in the second age. I don't think they're suddenly going to magic up a whole load of extra rights that they can show first age stuff. But it, if we get flashbacks, it will be more likely to be Galadriel's relationship with her brother rather than here's a little yeah. bit of extra information about the Noldor. Yeah, maybe Feanor, maybe Silmarils and Feanor, if they want to flesh out the Celebrimbor storyline. So I, I I, do think maybe Sauron tells him about, you know, his grandfather. I don't know. Uh, could be that that were the flashbacks I, I want to see. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I would love to see that too. Let's go to... Um, Let's get to question a couple of random questions. 444 saying, do you think that weekly episodes distribution is the right choice? Certainly good from marketing and general buzz perspective, but maybe release all episodes at once will be better to prove if this is good storytelling. Um, so, I mean, I, I mean, my take is, I mean, I like weekly and, and I think this comes from Bezos, frankly, I, he was talking about, mm -hmm wanting to have weekly event TV like Game of Thrones. So I think this comes from on high. So I don't think there's much chance of it changing. Um, I, I, if weekly 
is done well, I think it's great. And we've seen that. We saw that in Game of Thrones. We saw that in things like The Mandalorian. Uh, people were talking about this every time an episode came out, what what mm -hmm. happened that episode. And I think that's great. Um, we will have to see whether... And actually, we're seeing it with House of the Dragon now, is that I don't know what your Twitter timelines are like, but every time an episode of House of the Dragon happens, people are talking about what happened in that episode. <laughs> so I completely understand why they want to do that. They have to be good, and there has to be a thing each episode that works so we'll see they we we haven't we, we just had the two episode drop first of all and all the excitement about the the show as a whole when they get into the uh week by week uh then we will see um personally i prefer it to dropping the whole thing like um with the witcher say i that doesn't really work for me i understand why but i much prefer these things drawn out it allows a lot more of these kind of conversations about things rather than did you like the show or not like the show um this allows us to actually get into the detail of it yeah and and we have such a long wait ahead of us do you know i do, i mean i'm not really involved in 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 leaks and everything but have they even started production or filming season 2 because they've uh, yeah, as I understand it, yes, as in the filming is due to start, I think, within weeks, I think is the, uh, okay. the feeling, because they've moved uh, production from New Zealand up to London, so it did take them a little while yeah. to... I mean, so you can have really your Tom Bombadil role one day, and yeah, hiring people as well and getting getting everything. And and as I understand that there's there's a actual very practical problem, which is. All of the, if you think of all of the big high fantasy shows going on at the moment, as well as things like Star Wars, we got the House of the Dragon, we got The Witcher. They're all filming in the UK right now in studios dotted around the outside of London. Um, and they all want to use the same people doing all of the, the same logistical stuff. So yeah. um, actually, literally hiring the backroom staff is quite hard. Um, but as I understand it, they've got scripts almost done they've got uh the yeah. sort of the sets all sorted it's just a matter of now getting uh getting the time in so uh that should start within the next few weeks before probably before they even get to house of the dragon filming season two as well yeah so but but see then there's such a long wait for season two so people can binge it you know afterwards i i'd like i mean you know i I would I wouldn't mind watching it uh, back to back but I think weekly and they have 10 episodes so it's actually really cool because we'll be busy till no do they have 10 no they have eight it's eight, eight episodes eight? of this there's 10 episodes of House, House of, of the, the Dragon, Dragon. oh sorry yeah okay but we'll still be busy till mid of October or something like that yeah. which is nice yeah, yeah. As, and and then at some point, uh, actually, when I was my last live stream, I happened to have Dusty Wheel, um, uh, the Wheel of Time uh, expert, fantastic channel. Go Yay. and check him out if you want to talk Wheel of Time stuff. So I managed to to get from him when the Wheel of Time season two is going to air. Springtime is what he said. Basically, he would he would be surprised if it was if it was before oh. April. I was expecting a bit earlier, but apparently that's that's going to happen around then. Uh, so that's yeah. if you enjoyed that, that's something else to look forward to. Creative branches asking if we're going to get large time jumps, um, so that we can get a thematic discussion on the social dynamics of immortal characters. I'm really excited for this. If it happens, it's been introduced with Elrond and Durin. But the dynamics between Arondir, Bronwyn, and Theo could blossom into an incredible and unique story. Do you think elves' immortality juxtaposed against their immortal friends will be a major part of the Rings of Power? Where do you see this uh, a chance for this in the coming squashed centuries? Now, this is before we saw any of this. This was um, what my biggest concern was. I'll be honest, and I think it was probably quite a few people's biggest concern when they talked about a, um, a contracted timeline um, that, and, and what I what I understood, which seems to be what they're doing, is that roughly the first a thousand years is of the second age is the same that as we've seen there have been some tweaks, but roughly there have been a thousand years for civilizations to grow and cities to develop and things like that. Then all of the events of the rest of the like the next couple of thousand years or so are going to get squashed into a human lifetime. Now, 
it, how whether they do time jumps in that, I don't know. But clearly, we've seen that Isildur, for example, is introduced in this season. We've seen shots of him. We know the cast list. So he is here. He will definitely be here at the end of season five because we know what happens with Isildur at the end of season five and Sauron are cutting the ring off. So um, it will be squashed into his adult lifetime. Um, yeah. Maybe they'll do some time jumps between seasons. It's possible, but it's not going to be enough, in my view, to show at a very real level, the difference between elf lives and human lives. Now, that is one of the big concerns when it comes to the Numenor plot in particular. Because the Numenor plot, we're not there yet on the show. I'm I'm assuming we're going to go to Numenor in this episode. Uh, but when we get there, what is this growing discontent over centuries over millennia why is it that the elves get to live forever and we don't how do they get eternal life what's this place called the undying lands it sounds like if we were there then we would have eternal life as well and this kind of um unhappiness with the state of the world and how it is is fundamental to how why numenor falls so they will have to show that I they are aware of this to be fair. The actor there who's playing Farazon has talked about this and has basically said, I recognize this is on my shoulders because I need to move the entire thing from a position that we're at now, the height of civilization, to a position where we're completely disgruntled with everything and the whole thing's gone to pot. And I'm the center of that, so he's aware of that. Um we have to wait and see how well they do. But I think the short, just to answer the specific question, the short answer is no, I do not think that there is going to be time for a full playing out of the issues that we might see between, say, Arondir and Bronwyn. Uh, wherever that relationship is going to be going, we're not going to see Arondir staying the same age and Bronwyn growing old. No. And, you know, that, that is what you said about Numenor, because, again, this is mainly the age of Numenor, right, the, the second age. And um, Tolkien, it was so important for Tolkien that this is the downfall of a civilization and not just due to evil interfering, but mankind themselves did that. It, it almost didn't take Sauron. When did Sauron come to Numenor? What we know of, just literally in the end, he was there a prisoner for 50 years. Maybe he's been there before, you know, he's a shapeshifter, but he was just there the last 50 years of, again, 3,400 years. The decay of Numenor and the downfall started way earlier. There was a point of no return way before Arpharazon, right? Um... And, and Tolkien hinted at this many times. So it didn't take evil for this civilization, you know, to to um, yeah, well, well to to cause their own doom in a way. That there, there were one of the reasons was the envy, you know, of this of 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 the elves of a questioning. You know, they they had this undying lands literally in sight of them. They could see it. They the elves even came. They taught them things. And from generation to generation, people started asking these questions and they were more and more and less and less satisfied with what they had. And I mean, we can see this in our time, right? Um, and, and that's so sad. That's a sad and downfall of a civilization. And I'm, I'm a bit, well, it is sad that we don't see this portrayed, right? And this has a lot to do with the immortality factor and um, with the elves and the undying lands basically inside because Numenor was always in between. It was in between the land of the men and with a normal lifespan and the lands of the elves, right? They were never here nor there. And that is, you know, the tragedy of Numenor. And um, yeah, so it is hard to portray that with a... With a, with a um, compressed timeline and as you said that poor sword you know that poor actor because I think Arfarazon I mean how do they want to do it I think they just portray him as a power player because they can't tell the whole story of the 35 other kings right they can't and and 
I mean, I don't know how they're going to do this. The, my assumption is that they're just going to kind of fudge the issue about what happened in the past, and they're not really going to talk yeah. about many previous kings or queens. Um, they'll just, I mean, they may mention Elros, uh, but I think I think they they'll will... mention Tar Palantir because we see yeah. her using, and that was Miriel's father. Uh, yeah, her father. Um, and he was so creepy. He made the prophecy. You know, we see the tree and everything. So I do think we see that. We see him. I I, th I think so. But the, the ones in between will almost yeah. certainly get squashed and they'll probably not even mention it too much, no. I don't think. So I, I think I'd like to talk more about Numenor next week because we will have seen it by then. And I think that we will have a lot more we can get our teeth into. But yeah, this is something that... It was a big concern for me and others before we, we went into this. And we have to see how this is going to play out because on the face of it, there isn't the time to be telling the story that uh, that Tolkien was, was wanting, really. But I yeah. want to move on to Meteor Man. Um, this or the stranger, as, as they're calling him, um, on on the show. I don't know whether this uh, was it. Was it Fellowship of Fans who came up? With I think him? Harry. I, I think it I, was I, Harry. I think it was. Uh, so hat tip to 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 Harry over on the Fellowship of Fans. Um, it's a much better name than the stranger. But anyway, I got got a couple of questions from my patrons, so I'll sort of put these together, and then we'll we'll just. We'll start speculating, I think. Carol Reardon saying, still hoping to find out if the stranger is a blue wizard. Uh, I have always thought that the Astari came and knew who they were and what they were supposed to be doing. And Dan McKay saying, am I right that Meteor Man seems to be purely a show invention? And as far as we conclude together, not, identify, not identifiably something from Tolkien. He has evil power, but presumably can't be Sauron because Sauron is already in Middle-earth and can't be Morgoth because Morgoth is chained up. Um, I don't think the Blue Wizards would be characterized by powers of corruption and death like Meteor Man. Are there any other Maya candidates that we know of? Or is he someone completely new? So I will, in two days' time, I think I will be releasing my Who is Meteor Man video. So I will, <laughs> uh, I will give my, my full view on it then. And I would be shocked if I did not spoil my views in this, because I always spoil my videos which are coming up. Um, uh, but uh, I think we've got quite a lot of clues already uh, about Meteor Man. Um, the, the, the fandom generally have been discussing a few different options um so i mean i'll run down a few of them and then helen if you if you let me know what you think and then we'll we'll Definitely. try and spoil my video uh so um <laughs> I, I think what one of the early thoughts which quite a few people have still got is that this might be gandalf um uh he's a an old man who's come here and he's a character who's got name recognition um so perhaps it's gandalf the blue wizards who were also part of the Astari. When we get the five who came at the same time in the Third Age, we get Saruman, Radagast, Gandalf, and the two blue wizards who disappear off to the east. Tolkien did write that they were also there in the Second Age, so perhaps this is one of the two blue wizards. Um, perhaps this could be the Balrog. We've seen a Balrog in the trailer, so that's a possibility. Um, perhaps, and this was what my first thought when I first saw Meteor Man up here, I thought, ha ha, this is Sauron. Um, uh, so perhaps this is Sauron. Um, and then I think option number five is a completely new character, which we can't put it beyond them that this is a show. Half of the characters here are completely new. So um, those, I think, those are the the usual suspects. I don't know what you call them, but those are those I think are the, the most popular ones. Helen, where do you fall on this? Who who do you think Meteor Man is? <laughs> Sorry, I just drank water. <laughs> um, so I do think we, as you said, we got a few clues. Okay, let's let's name them, right? So um, we did get the aspect of the cold flame, cold fire, cold hot things, right? Um, Galadriel, if you remember, I think that was episode one when Galadriel mentioned the flame and the flame was cold 
because why? Um, they, because evil was present, right, um, in the fortress they were in. Then, um, I always want to say Poppy. What What's her name? It's not Poppy. It's... Um, uh, the other hobbit, Nori, um, Nori, Nori yeah. Um, so Nori did fell, fall down the crater, and again she touched the stone, and the stone was not hot, and she was very surprised by this. What was when they threw the ring in the fire? You know, in um, in the OG movies, the ring was cold, right? So there are a lot of hints that hint and scream evil, right? Um, so I, I would, and then you had the fireflies in episode two, and I didn't, I, I don't know, what, what, how did you see that? Because I saw people reacting differently to it. I thought they died when he tried to play, play with them or try to whatever interact with them. It wasn't like Gandalf with a moth and with a little animals, you know. They, they, the, the thingy died, right? The fireflies. So again evil question mark and the the whole thing with the meteor and with evil arising again in middle earth reminded me of when morgoth came to middle earth and he fought angolian she attacked him he gave out a scream a big scream because he needed help and he asked for help and the balrogs came um so i i do think the meteor person man a uh, creature is a Balrog in another form, and now people in the chat will go crazy. But yeah, I mean, but yes, they can take. It's a Mayar spirit. They can take any form they want. Um, so I do think I would say evil creature at least uh, confirmed, and I would say it's a Balrog. And my theory was, you know, whoever the the baddie Sauron, whoever. Um, asked for aid, and he came in, you know, with a with a meteorite, um, and is now in Middle Earth, aiding his master. Well, there you go, Um So I, I, I think, I think I agree, actually, uh, which is very annoying. Um, <laughs> I, I think there, I, I, I think the biggest clues are this is a Maya. I think is reasonably yeah. clear. This isn't a human. This isn't an elf. This isn't. I mean, this isn't a normal being. Normal beings don't travel by meteor. So this is clearly a sort of a higher being of some kind. I'm almost certain this isn't a Valar, Valar or anything like that. So we're looking at Maiar level. Um, yeah. Now, then you get the you you name checks a lot of kind of things that look evil i would also see if say that leaf that fell with uh, when gilgalad was there yeah. that was corrupted that was rotten there was something going on and always yeah. in tolkien's world and we saw that down in the southlands plot as well when evil exists, yeah. it isn't just like an evil person is there. This infects the land. This this affects nature. It corrupts yeah. nature in some way. And so that that happening was a clue. There's there's a bad thing. There's evil happening here. And that happened mm -hmm. as the the comet, the meteor, went overhead. So all the clues of this is evil. And then all the clues are that this is a Maya. And then all the clues is this is something to do with fire. Uh, a fiery comet, uh, the 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 fireflies, um, the yeah. um, the thing that he he was saying when he was sort of uh, uh, repeatedly saying these things, it was mana ure. Now I've yeah. I've been asking uh, some Tolkien sort of scholars about what this means and it's it's a lot more complicated as you would expect with these kinds of things depends on whether you go by what the subtitles say or how it sounds to be pronounced but i think nobody disputes that ure is fire in some yeah. way so whatever he is saying he's saying the word fire or heat or a thing that produces warmth it's something like that so there is a link. So an evil Maya to do with fire. I, I mean, 
where you don't need to watch my video coming out in a couple of days. I think you've 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 seen where we're going with this one. Um, I, it seems relatively straightforward here. I think the Gandalf chat is is a little bit of a distraction to me. And the other thing I would just say, which I may or may not put in that video, but I think it works as a visual. When you look at him, so much of the time his shape because they put him in that big cloak. I think that was yeah. deliberate. His shape his does not look shape. human. No. And he yeah. like reaches out his arms and it's almost, dare I say it, it almost looks like he's got wings at a couple of points. Um, <laughs> Robert. So, uh, he clearly hasn't got wings. Balrogs don't have wings. Uh, but it does look almost a non-human shape. So I think this yeah. is a kind of a visual clue that this is not a human. Uh, mm -hmm. So there we go. Chat is... Um, uh, that's what we think. I'll just have a quick flick through whether people are uh, Saruman, Greg Hearn saying Saruman is a definite possibility. Uh, Carl Karsnuck saying fire my R. Say that's 10 times fast. I will not try, but thank you. <laughs> um, Nicholas Norden saying if it is a Balrog, though, why would it arrive by meteor? That's a, an excellent question. Why would anyone arrive by meteor is probably a fair enough uh, question. Dogberry, but it's the fastest way. It's the fastest way. Imagine traveling. That's where the Balrog was before. Uh, is Saruman a possibility? Says Dogberry, 99. Um, Kaziglu Bay saying Meteor Man is Blood Raven confirmed. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> when in doubt of lame Blood Raven. Um, okay, so uh, Nicholas Norton also saying I would not mind it being Gandalf. Personally, I would not like it to be uh, Gandalf. That's I won't get into that this time. If it is Gandalf, uh, we riot. Um, uh, we don't riot, <laughs> but uh, I really don't want it to be Gandalf. Okay, let's go and have a look at. Can I can um, I add just one little oh, thing on. to that scene? Not about the 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 Balrog confirmed Balrog now, um, but about Nori, and I really like that because you know I always love the beginning of Frodo. So Frodo was very hesitant, right? This is how Gandalf knew he's the right one to carry the ring, right? Um, and Nori was right from the beginning what she said, you know, I feel like this is my duty. This is my um, calling. This is, she's very different because a lot of people, you know, are comparing this, but she's literally the opposite. How she starts is literally the opposite of, of how Frodo starts with being, you know, thrown into this world um i found that very very fascinating that she she says the exact opposite of and feels the exact opposite she feels like this is her calling um and i really like that that they put this against each other yeah yeah uh, yeah i think that's quite interesting so it's um but as we're talking about nori why don't we talk? I, did, I haven't got a specific question on this, but the half foot uh, and the half foot plot. Um, I I <clears throat> found myself liking this. Um, I wasn't sure whether I would the the because it's it's very easy to get it wrong, and this is just like a kind of an Ewok kind of thing, like just, just like trying to make it all nice and happy. Um, but I thought. I thought uh, leaving the Irish accents as aside, which I understand caused a little bit of a stir in some in some parts of Ireland, but um, <laughs> the I I, th I think they came across well. I think as a sort of a um, a, a community, there was there was humour there, there was love there, and it did feel very attached to middle earth which is i think what they were they were going for um but did you did you like them did you did you sort of engage with this um yeah as you said you know in the beginning i was like why we don't need this you know i, I get that they want to start with something but they didn't even start with it the the, the lord of the ring started you know to make you feel at home to make you, you know, not to throw you into this crazy fantasy world and throw a Tom Bombadil at you and you're like, what is happening? You start with the Hobbits, with the Shire, something you can relate to. But what I did like, they didn't do this here specifically, what I did like about them is when, oh, what's his name? Um, the, Brit the, the British actor, the, the ta Lenny town Henry. healer. Le yeah, what's his name in the show? Um, uh, Sadok. 
set of bur burrows or something like yeah, yeah something like that i love the aspect that he had this book and because you know i'm very you know if you live and grew up near the countryside everybody has these wisdoms you know when when some some certain birds fly very low in august then it, the winter will be really cold and stuff like that so he had this book and i really loved that he then interpreted mm, something is dodgy something is off because we know how important this whole book and and what is the Lord of the Rings? What is the Silmarillion? Somebody writing a book, writing a story, right? And I like that they they have that with the Hobbits because later in, I think the library of the Hobbits is in Mikkel Delving. And, you know, and they have some dodgy history. They claim they sent archers in the in the war with the Witch King um, and stuff like that. So I really like that they started off early on even in the second age you know taking down because we don't see that very often yes with high cultures like Numenorians, but the hobbits not so much so i like he had this book of explaining nature and explaining things so i really i found that really adorable and cool because later on this whole writing down stories is so important for the hobbits so i really like this connection yeah i thought that worked really well the you know the going through i'm sure i've seen this before so yeah the people coming early there's wolves yeah this means a thing um yeah. and it's trying to work out what does this mean and i thought that that actually to add to the the feel of there's something wrong and yeah. they couldn't put their finger on it um but they just yeah. sensed it there's those huntsmen are going by too early yeah in the season. yeah that's that there's yeah. something wrong there um yeah. the, the the stars there's something wrong the skies are strange that there's there's, there's yeah. wolves around what's that it's just this um yeah. they don't have the answers but they can sense no. things that others perhaps yeah. can't yep yeah and others need a palantiri and you know very developed technology for it they have you know their stories what their ancestors told them they wrote it down so i i, I really like that yeah, uh, works well. And yes, people asking when uh, when it drops. So they've changed the the episode drop times have changed. So it's different. Week one was mm -hmm. earlier than it five would hours. normally be. So yeah, five hours from now. So it's uh, five a.m. We're not my going time, this long, which is six a.m. Helen's time, I think. So that's yeah, midnight that. Eastern time. So uh, that's that's what we're looking at, and that's going to be the same as I understand it through the rest of the season so uh, we're not doing this live stream all the way up until then you do not need to worry we, we will be uh, <laughs> that's what we'll, chris we'll that's what chris does shout out to the philosophers games you know i've been on so many streams with chris recently we do other german talking society ones and streams with chris and he literally streams for seven hours so people if you're interested in uh a very detailed maps and content uh, go to the philosophers games he's really cool we love him absolutely seconded there uh chris's uh his attention for detail and his uh, stamina and uh, say, <laughs> the size of his bladder is astonishing <laughs> because to, to be able to get through like even three hours i'm knackered at the end of it but uh the, yeah to, to do the the length of live streams that, that he somehow manages i have no idea how no I always disappear yeah. after two or three. But <laughs> yeah, I don't think I don't think he minds too much. Um, yeah. Let's talk about the Southlands uh, plot. Now, this is something that we both said at the top that we'd enjoyed. We hadn't necessarily expected to enjoy. Um, I'll just sort of expand on that a little bit. I've got I've got a question as well uh, from one of my patrons about this. But um, just in terms of why I liked it and hadn't expected to like it, but this is completely new is is the, the the short answer and it so it wasn't anything that was uh we're not taking characters that we know and possibly changing them what we've got is a gap which tolkien has left probably deliberately and there is uh and a clear attempt here to show how you got from position a to position b and trying to work it through we know that there were orcs there somewhere we know that there are humans there who uh, they were, um, they did fall under Morgoth's uh, um, sort of shadow for a while. And it does kind of make sense that the elves would be keeping an eye on them. This does actually fit in with 
uh, this idea we were talking about earlier that Gilgalad knew something was going on down there. How would he know? Well, presumably he had some sort of spies or people keeping an eye out, something like that. Uh, so that the setup works for me, that this is roughly what it is. Um, uh, and then the way that they developed that, I love the, you know, the elf human romance thing whether it actually leads anywhere i don't know but this is a talking theme this elf human romance um that both sides frown on um that's something that that is is uh, sort of echoes in lots of other things that Tolkien wrote uh, i love the sort of horror element the the idea of like this one orc kind of getting us back <laughs> to this idea that orcs are scary um, in a way that certainly from Peter Jackson's films, once you've had thousands of them running at you and then uh, Legolas kills five of them with one arrow, that then you just think, actually, they're not that powerful. But they are. They are really quite scary. And I also love this uh, um, mystery sword. We'll talk about that in just one moment. But, but having a, a clearly evil sword appearing and what's going to happen there that has made me want to go okay i want to see what happens next with this this is clearly something's going to be happening here so i thought this worked really well and it's at the moment it's separated from the rest of the plot there was um just a link across to what we're talking about with a, mo a moment ago with the harfoots there was a fantastic bit which i don't think I didn't notice in the second until the second time. Nori at one point, when they're discussing all these signs, she says, I wonder if there's something going on down south. And it's like, actually, there is. This is what's happening down south. And it's like there's this instinctive, I think maybe something's going wrong down there. They don't know. They've not been down there, but maybe but they just get this feeling. So I for all of those reasons, it surprised me of actually being what I wanted and didn't know that I wanted. Um, but what what's your sort of overall thoughts on that? Did you did you like those things that I was talking about? I mean, you, you looked like you weren't certain about the sort of elf human romance element of it, but uh, leaving that as... Uh, no, you liked it. Well, the thing is, I think Tolkien already tells us how this one will end because it is important that she is the female and the human um, and there are various reasons um, for for this just didn't work for Tolkien, and he had one example with also a healer actually, um, and um, and the the undying one, immortal one, is uh, the male, so the elf, um, and when it did work is when the male was the human so the other way around so we had two examples and later on even more with Aragorn and Arwen and the princess of Dol Amroth I think those were the two in the third age so I I, I don't mind that I, I I I'm okay with it it doesn't diminish you know what what the other ones had um you know they live close together it, it's perfectly fine um but what I also liked um, was that, as you say, you know, because we know Sauron had to feed, even in the Third Age, his armies. So the Sea of, um, I, I made a cool video about um, Mordor and the, you know, how did Mordor look, what, what, where the mountains were, where fortresses in Mordor. Um, and I really like, so, so the thing is, there um, was life, there were people living, this is not completely made up, because Sauron had to feed his arm, armies, armies. Um, so around the Sea of Norn, although this is, Southland is a place a bit different, you're not as evolved here to show the map, right? This is not what we're doing. No, 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 there's no, okay. no technology Sorry. here. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So um, w they they fed their army. So there were farmers, there were farms, there was fertile land. Mordor wasn't a complete wasteland. Um, so especially around the Sea of Nun, um, there, there was greenery, you know, that there, there was life, there were people, um, you know, 
taking care of the crops and everything. So I, I think it's cool to to give this a face um, in in the show. So I really like that. And question to you: Do you think because I always love the storyline of the Black Numenorians, and we know because this show is called the Rings of Power, so there need to be rings to be given out to nine mortal men. And we do know, you know, somewhere of Numenorian descent, Black Numenorians. Um, so do you think is this a salute to black Numenorians because what they say what the elves say what Aronde and the other guys said um, is these humans are evil and they partly still are it's not just their past it's you know this is still dwelling here um, so is this black Numenorian plot line I don't think so I, th I think no no I, I think this is just uh, I mean, back in the first age, I mean, they squashed the first age, but uh, back in the first age, you get some humans who went west. Those are the humans uh, who became known as the Edain. They joined up with the Noldor elves and fought against Morgoth, and they were the ones who inherited Numenor. The other humans who stayed in the east and the south they were the ones who fell under the shadow, okay. broadly speaking, think, of Morgoth. Okay. And I think this is what we're talking about here. I, I don't think okay. we're talking about the Numenorians yet. Um, in fact, it wouldn't surprise me if they uh, have in show that the Numenorians haven't really expanded out into the world yet. Uh, that's because... If, if we've not had contact yet between Gilgalad and the Numenorians, then maybe maybe they've just seen the Numenorians haven't, they've just stayed on their island. Um, but we but, see Miriel later in the Southlands. These are the riding scenes, and this is where Miriel is fighting with her army of, of Numenorians, and this seems to be in the Southlands. This is why I was thinking in the trailers yes yeah but this is so that's in the future here here so i i think i mean very broadly from what we've seen on the trailers it does appear so galadriel goes to numenor meets miriel and then they head off over to the southlands and they meet up with the southlands plot that we've got and okay. off the back of that we get a, a battle in some way um so that seems roughly where it is but there's no indication yet that the numenorians have come out and set up their ports and, and settled over there maybe they have we just haven't been told about that bit yet um yeah. but yeah so i i really i really liked it i really liked the the orcs burrowing on underground this this should be showing us how you move from that lush area there to Sauron's heartland, because it does. In the Second Age, Mordor becomes his heartland. He builds uh, Barad-dûr during this time, um, the, his, his great fortress. That And uh, later on in the Second Age, this is where he goes when he forges the One Ring. He comes back to his home base. So by the time we get there, this should all be his homeland. Uh, yeah. We should have this great forge there in uh, Mount Doom where he can be forging the One Ring. So, I mean, I don't know what pace they're going to be going at, but presumably that might be, I don't know, end of season two, something like that, maybe season three. It's, it's not that far away in terms of the show, which means that this season has to be the creation of Mordor in some way, shape or form. How it how it becomes Sauron's base or what will be Sauron's base. So yeah. I, I like this idea. I, I'm i looking forward to seeing how it's going. There is one thing in particular I had a question from um, Dan McKay about, do we know what the evil broken sword is? Uh, is it identifiable based on contents of Tolkien's books or is it something that we're going to find out about later in the show so i mean i i speculated ages ago when we just had pictures of this uh that this might be gurthang oh, which is uh, a legendary sword in tolkien's uh world which was forged back in time and it was used in the uh the first age in a legendary way in the first age and it's um it has a number of things about it, which it's it 
speaks at one point it seems to have a personality yeah. um it gets at the very end of it it breaks it is a black sword um it seems to sort of lust after after fighting and vengeance Blood. it's all the things that this sword appears to be um that doesn't mean it's it is this and i've not done a double check to see whether or not it's actually mentioned in the appendices to the Lord of the Rings or whether this is just a Silmarillion thing. So it's entirely possible that this isn't that, but it is something sort of loosely based on that. Mm. Um, now, in any event, it is evil. I think we can largely ag agree that what whatever it is, uh, if they gave us any more signs, it it's black, it's got Sauron's mark on it. Uh, it. It has fire and black smoke enveloping it. It drinks blood. Uh, when we look at it, we can hear black speech in sort of pounding away in the background. This is evil, yeah. this sword. So what, what do you think, Helen, is the significance? Clearly, this is not a good thing that Theo has got this sword. Clearly, this is going to impact on him. He's already got anger management issues. Just check out that way he, uh, he like, attacked <laughs> the floor when he thought there were mice under there. There's already clearly, a th and he stole this. Let's also not forget he's not. He didn't start off as a as a nice innocent child. He went no. off and literally stole this from underneath the floorboard of of somebody else. We don't know who. Um, but this isn't going to be good for him. What? What do you think this is? Where do you think this plot line might be going? Yeah, I I was like you, or I am like you, uh, in the way I, I do think actually it is a it is hinting at something like Gurthang because what do the baddies do? They can't create themselves, right? They corrupt things, you know, eroded, or maybe the elves created. So I would really love this idea. I mean, yes, the sword was evil from the beginning, right? But still, Eol was an elf. He crafted this sword, not with, I don't think it was just malice intentions, but yes, he put malice into the sword. This is what Melian said, right? So, but I would love that then Sauron picks up something from the elves and uses it as his first OG Morgul blade. I think that is what what this thing is. Um, so I, I would really like the connection to actually the elves made it once um, and then he took it and corrupted it even more. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do... I do think in a way, because we know the ring and also the swords and other magic objects, they call people, right? Um, so I do think this sword did call Theo. This is how I would interpret it. And we still don't know who's the daddy, right? Um, so is, is Halbrand? Because it was weird the way they, they said it. Um, because I think Halbrand is from that region. I think he was that king they were talking about. I don't think they hinted at Morgoth. I think there was an actual king once there. And I think this talisman or whatever this mm -hmm. thingy he was wearing around his neck um that is um a symbol of the royal house he's from and is he the father i don't know so i think that the sword called to theo and he's somehow blood because it was asking for his blood um i think it was um connected to it somehow theo is connected to this and the sword was calling for for his master or somebody to free him like the ring did right yeah um so i think i think theo's dad is a is a fascinating because this will come up it's and 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 the who was the king of that area will also come up because it's now been mentioned twice um sorry did i say something very funny <laughs> no meteor man is elton jordan <laughs> Somebody just, sorry. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Uh, eight bit synth. You've just uh, one joke of the day. Um, the uh, but yeah. So this is um, uh, two things are definitely going to happen. They're, they're, we are definitely going to hear uh, about Theo's dad because that was just you can't just leave. Yeah. You know, where's your dad gone? He just ran off. You don't even know why we have to find out at some point and the king was mentioned twice um the we get in 
in the Southlands, in the the pub or whatever it is that in uh, the guy comes up, say when you know when our king returns, kind of things like okay, and and yeah. then we get Galadriel <laughs> asking who's the king? Is that the king of where you're from? Yeah, yeah. To mention something twice, it has to come back at some point. So, yeah. um, we can link this across to Hellbound in just one moment, but that sword. Yes, I think this idea of it being a, a sort of a an early Morgul blade of some kind, that really works for me. Again, it being some sort of corrupted elf thing, again, that mm -hmm. kind of works for me. Um, the idea Ooh, that... So what corrupt... is happening? How do we agree so much tonight? I, well, I don't know. Um, uh, elves are all horrible. Uh, anyway, so that's, uh, that's, that's how I get Helen to disagree with me. Um, but... But this will in some way corrupt Theo. And uh, I think we have to, and we've said this a few times in previous streams, we have to be looking out for not just Sauron, we will come on to Sauron in just one second, but also who are going to be the Nazgul? Who will be these great lords who are given the rings of power? Because if we're saying that it's, uh, the ring will be forged maybe towards the end of next season or early season three. The rings of power will have to be given out you know, before this show ends. And surely some of the people we will have been introduced to already. And they won't be the characters that we know. It's not going to be Galadriel or Elrond or yeah, it's, it's not going to be Isildur or Elendil. This will be new characters. So... Some of the characters that are here will be given rings of power. Now, it does work. I like this idea that perhaps um, Theo's dad was the king or the king in exile or something like that. Yeah. If only because Bronwyn appears to be far better dressed than anyone else around her. Um, yes. There does seem to be some kind of money there or something there that she just seems to be respected by people uh if not always like followed but she seems to like uh they kind of acknowledge her in some way and, and as her I say, opinion yeah. of elves her opinion of the elves is very i think the royals even dealt with the elves in another yeah. way than so the normal yeah she's she, she seems to be different to the other people there in some way um now the, a fan theory from quite early on is that Theo will become the Witch King. I don't think I'm going to go, go that far, uh, but um, that actor will grow up. So mm -hmm. this isn't going to be a child actor all the way through. In fact, I can say from when I was at the, uh, the premiere and all the actors went past, I did not recognise that actor because... Ooh. He's grown like a foot, <laughs> um, so um, he's he's a lot taller now and a, a lot close. To definitely not just like moody, early yeah. to mid teen, but definitely like starting to properly grow up. Uh, so this character is going to be in their twenties by the late uh, the, the later seasons. So the potential for this to be one of the ring rates is definitely there. Yeah. Um. But let's go to, I think this is the last question I've got from my patrons. Um, oh, no, I've got, yeah, a couple more I want to pick up on. Um, this is a, a morally question. Hi there, Mara, by the way. Um, uh, asking, when do we think Sauron will appear? We sort of touched on this a moment ago as one possibility, but uh, what? Wh how do you think he will appear? Um, and how are you hoping that he'll be portrayed since he is the big baddie? Um, so I think I think he definitely will appear. I think he has to be introduced by the end of this season. I, it would not surprise me if it's like a big reveal at the end of the season. Here's Sauron, um, uh, because they can't... But do you think, is he, he one of the characters we've seen? Sorry, I can't, have you got your mute on? can't hear you anyway i'll carry on talking i can't hear helen um but uh he will get um it, it, when he becomes anatar everyone will know who he is so before then uh there will have to if they want to do a big reveal that will have to be before he appears and starts advising keller brimble so probably towards the end of the season but helen i don't know whether you can are you back on again 
but the chat can hear me can you hear me okay i can't hear helen oh everyone else can it's maybe it's just me um oh well um uh, <laughs> you, you speak for a moment about you you, you talk about helen uh, about uh, sauron and uh, and then i will um uh, i will pick up when you finish talking don't 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 worry about your mic everyone else can hear you it's just me well, but there's a delay on YouTube, so I'm not sure. Can you still hear me, people? I'm sorry, it might be my dodgy internet. Okay, I can't hear you. I'm I'm sorry, Helen. I I can't hear you at all. So I've no idea um, when when you've you've finished. Um, uh, but I let's. Uh, I will. Uh, which is a shame because I I had I had a great question. Helen's bunked out for a moment, a moment. Perhaps she will come back in again. Um, uh, I, I did have a question which I saw in the chat earlier, which um, I will surprise Helen with this when she she comes back in. But I wanted to ask somebody uh, in the chat. This was Michelania saying, what would you rather fight, a Balrog-sized penguin or 10 penguin-sized Balrogs? Which I thought would be a fantastic question to put to, to Helen. So hopefully she will return so I can ask her that. Um, uh, here... I think she is. No, I, and there we go. Okay, some streaming difficulties uh, here, uh, but it's Helen, say me, something now. You. Can you hear me? Test, test, test. No, I still can't hear you. I think this is a problem at my end. Uh, I do, I do apologise. Um, it's uh, may, maybe my um, my internet connection is not. And you can just sort of uh, sit there. Oh, I've I've just had a pop up on my computer saying, "Are you having sound problems? Open the audio <laughs> trouble." Well, thank you very much. Yes, I am having sound problems, but you know when your computer. You think it must be spying on you. Um, uh, anyway, I, I do apologize. I'm, I'm going to have to uh, sort of like uh, round this. I'm going to let Helen talk for a few minutes and she can wave at me when she's finished talking because I'm going to assume uh, that everyone else can uh, can hear. But uh, Helen, why don't you just talk for a little bit about Sauron? How do you think Sauron's going to be revealed? Um, and who do you think Sauron is? And I'll try and guess what you said. But if you want to wave when you finish talking, that would be great. <laughs> okay, noted. Um, okay, so I don't think we've met Sauron yet. Um, and I do think, uh, well, we'll meet more baddies first, because I do think um, this character Adar or whatever, the corrupted elf or whoever, that is the lead we'll meet him next episode, hopefully. Um, and we saw him in the preview. So I do think step by step more evil characters and baddies and servants of Sauron will be revealed and he will be revealed last episode maybe and I don't think it is somebody we've met but we will hear and get hints like I said you know with Celebrimbo why does he need to build this forge so urgently so Sauron was there hashtag Sauron was there so we'll hear more stories about and get more hints and clues but I do think we haven't seen him and I haven't well I mean IMDB and all these databases they are not really reliable um but I I think there's a secret around this character and uh I think yeah in in the last uh, episode um Mordor and Baradur will appear and will be revealed and so will Sauron but I don't think it's somebody we we've seen so far but we will be introduced to his kingdom of minions So I waving. think Helen... what, is <laughs> what is happening? Okay. Um, so Robert is gone. Is this? <laughs> I don't know what is happening. Um, no, we can't hear you, Robert. Yeah, yeah, Robert is gone. Robert, okay, I'm taking over the channel. 
you know, <laughs> make the show. Okay, good. Um, so I don't know what the patrons ask, but um, people feel, <laughs> yeah, let's uh, let's rant about dwarves. No, just kidding. I'll take some um, questions from the chat now. So people ask questions in the chat. I hope it's not going too fast. Um, Okay, start asking your questions. I'll try to answer them. Maybe let's speculate about um, season. Uh, what, what will happen in episode three. Who is the stranger? Bruno Sousa asks. Um, well, wait a second. Is he back? Is he back? Okay, um, sorry, okay, yeah, okay, I'm back, now I had internet problems, um, okay, sorry, um, Nicholas, uh, Nicholas Norden asks, do you think that Sauron could appear as multiple characters? Um, so you mean, um, that he shapeshifts and has different, well, we know obviously from the law that he appears in fair form in the second age. Um, and I do think we, and I hope we will see that, but again, as I said, I don't think it will be, um, one of the characters we've seen. So I don't think it's Halbrand to be fair, um, because I've seen a lot of people in the chat, um, speculating that it's him i do think halbrand is the witch king um and will be revealed as the witch king because i do think the witch king was of such oh wait I think hello he's back. oh he's back yay i'm back i well, <laughs> um sorry about that that was really weird um so um <laughs> I was if like, you're watching what is this happening? back a little bit later, I do I do humbly apologize. Uh, my computer literally just shut down on me. I have no idea what happened. Um, so uh, apologies. But uh, Helen, have you just been talking for the last couple of minutes? Yes, I did. I Excellent. Took well, thank you very much. I took um, questions from the chat. So um, where, where are you at? What, what are we talking about? Uh, we were talking about uh, the the witch king uh, and speculating who who the witch king might be. And do we have an answer? Um, I do think it's Halbrand. You think it's Halbrand? Okay. Well, th so Halbrand, I think is a suspicious character. I think everyone thinks he's a suspicious character. But just to draw a few things out, first of all he has absolutely no remorse when he cuts off half of the, you know, all of the people who's with on that raft and they all die. And it's like, yeah, well, it was just survival, wasn't it? And there was like, okay, maybe he's a pragmatist, but um, you'd at least have some kind of sorrow about that, but there's absolutely nothing. And then the other thing that um, I, I, I noticed was the storm. The storm was like the skies were literally blue while he was having this conversation with Galadriel. And then she says, I want you to take me to this place. And he says, now nah, I've got other plans. And then suddenly a storm appears out of nowhere. And it's like, it's almost as if he summoned a storm. So I think he's magical. I think yeah. he's evil. And I think that he's uh, incredibly suspect. Witch King, possibly. Um, I think there's a possibility he's Sauron as well. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see. Uh, Kevin Birch saying Sauron can change the weather. Hint. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think uh, what I will do, though, guys, uh, given the technical problems we had, uh, Helen, thank you so much for, for covering uh, while, while I was down for a bit there. But I think I'm going to start wrapping this one up uh, just to make sure that we don't uh, fall apart again. Uh, but Helen, why don't you let people know where they can let find me say you. one last let me say one yes, last thing about the the witch king and Halbrand and we know the witch king doesn't fear the water and where does she literally meet him in the water um so yes I I, I do think because he was of Numenorean uh, descent that was why Tolkien said he doesn't fear the water um but I I love that was his first introduction right he was on the water so I do think there's a hint um yes sorry 
that was my last word on that. No, a, a good point. Apparently, you were about to rant about dwarves, so I'm, I'm glad we managed to, to miss that. <laughs> Um, uh, just before I ask you to do that, uh, Reflective Rambling, thank you for reminding me. Yeah, if you have enjoyed this live stream, despite the technical difficulties, then um, the the way to say uh, to say thank you is is not any of the other things I'm about to mention. Uh, the best way to do that is to donate to an exceptionally worthy cause, which is for Alzheimer's mm -hmm. care and, uh, relief uh, and research as well, because you know research is absolutely paramount to try and make sure that we can defeat this thing in the long run. But uh, there will be a link somewhere, whether you're watching this live or whether you're watching this back up a little bit later, there will be a link somewhere. Please, if you have some spare money, that would be hugely appreciated. Uh, but Helen, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a delight as always. Uh, thank you for holding the fort for a little bit as well. Um, where where can people find you if they want if they want more clueless fangirl? <laughs> well, um, again, my my content at the moment is um, a bit uh, dodgy, as a few people uh, in the chat have uh, noticed, because I was talking about it a teeny tiny little bit on my channel as well. Um, I'm I'm pregnant. I'll uh, literally uh, give birth in four four weeks or something like that to a uh, very cute baby elf hopefully um and uh, yeah so this is why uh, you know i can't fully cover the show let's see how it goes but i'll be back on my channel one day um but there won't be content weekly i can't plan at this moment you know elves uh, of the first age or whatever age we live in are very what's the word F fidget uh, and you you can't plan with them um so who knows but yes if you want to subscribe to my channel i uh, have a lot of baddie topics explaining a lot of the baddies uh, that uh, well, of the Silmarillion, a lot of Silmarillion content, a lot about where did the elves come from, uh, a lot about um, dwarves. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> yes, El elves uh, and uh, baddies is the focus on my channel and Silmarillion content. So if you want to know more about the backstory of some of these characters, like Gilgalad, we get introduced to, uh, come and check out because these videos never get old. So it's you know, these videos might be two years old, but the, the story is still the same. So yeah, I would like if you subscribe to my teeny tiny channel and thank you again um, for your invite, Robert. I basically, inv I always invite myself to these streams. <laughs> but... It's true. She, she just keeps on asking until I say <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. uh, well, thank you so much. I would highly recommend it, by the way. Uh, it's a, I, I know haven't put things on there for a long time but it is an excellent channel so please do go um uh go over there and subscribe and do all of the good things um, i will make you disappear for just one moment so i can point at bits of my screen um if you are watching this back a little bit later you will find the link appearing here-ish which will be to other live streams of mine if you would like to watch that a link will appear around here in just a moment which is to my patreon page um patrons thank you for supporting me without your support I cannot do what I do, so I hugely appreciate it. So um, if you would like to support this channel, that is the best way to do it. Okay, uh, thank you everyone, fantastic questions. Moderators, I don't think I've shown you enough love. Uh, you've been doing amazing work today, as you always do. Thank you, moderators, you are fantastic. Uh, thank you for the generous donations, everyone. Take care, and I will see you again soon.